This weekend on the original Rochester Press Box. I'm Pete Chamble and I'm going to tell you why educationally based athletics is important to your life. And I'm John Dottilio. Hey, the Yankees are on the verge of doing something they haven't done in 21 years. And I'm Mike Catalana. Yeah, it's great. Thank the Pagulas, but somebody else needs to be thanked for keeping the Bills in Western New York. And I'm Bill Pucko. Simply be grateful when things are going well. Join us all this weekend on the original Rochester Press Box. Hello everyone and welcome to the original Rochester Press Box. I'm Bill Pucko, joined as always by John DeTulio, the HTK Sports Director. Billy, good to be back. 13 Wham News Sports Director Mike Catalan. Welcome good to be back. here. Yep. And it is our pleasure to welcome in Pete Shambo, the President-Elect of Section 5, the Athletic Director at Penfield High School. Thank you, Pete. Thanks for the invite. All right, cool. Hey, uh, we're always talking about, and we have, we talk about it all the time, social issue after social, social issue that kind of mesh with sports. It gives the kids, you always talk about the kids, a lot more to think about and consider Ray Rice, Michael Sam, Donald Sterling. What's the narrative like at the school level these days? It's consistent with what we've been doing all along. Uh, these situations uh, give us teachable moments. Uh, the conversation comes up on the bus, in the huddle, uh, prior to practice, after practice, and certainly the car ride home. And... Um, our message doesn't deviate from what it would have been, but it gives us an opportunity to talk about such things that um, we may not otherwise have. Uh, so I, when the Ray Rice issue pops this week, do you guys get together and say, here's what we should be doing, or does it just evolve? I think it more evolves. We, uh, we don't evolve or revolve around what happens at the professional levels. We're still education-based athletics. We're, we're talking about, uh, you know, DASA, Dignity for All Student Act, and no bullying, no hazing, um, you know, regardless of your sex, your uh, body makeup, your, what you wear. And so when we hear things about someone uh, being on a video, punching their fiance in the face and knocking her out cold, it's almost unfathomable for, to us because the level of what we're teaching our hope and dream is that none of our athletes would ever be in that situation. You take cross-section calls every day on these things. John, what do you hear? Well, I mean, just in, in my household, we've had, it's been a teachable moment for my daughter. Not the necessarily the Ray Rice, but other instances that go on in our culture where we've told her time and time again, it's never okay for any man to lay, her hand, to lay his hands on you, period. So it's a great teaching moment. But we've had, a, you know, we've had, you know, listen, when this story first broke with the Ray Rice incident, I, I would like to say everybody was uh, in favor of the commissioner, but that wasn't the case. I think until the video, until we actually saw it, I think now the guys came out and, and, and the phone calls overwhelmingly said, yeah, he should be suspended. But I think it took the video, mm. sad to say, for people to wake up and realize what Ray Rice did was wrong. And that's, it's sad, it's sad. You know, the, it, it, the crime was the same. Yeah. And Ray Rice came, it came, was forthcoming with the Ravens, told them what happened. It, it's like, th this is turned on him based on the fact that we're seeing it, but it's what he said. It's consistent with what he said. It is, and that's what makes it, um, well, I, I put, obviously, the blame in that part is, serious. it's Ray Rice. I mean, there's no other person in that port to blame. From that point going forward, in terms of what sports fans see and hear, there's immense blame on Roger Goodell, I think. I think he's handled this like an amateur, as poorly as you can possibly handle it. Now, back to the point of the teachable moments and what goes on at school. First of all, the kids see everything now. So it's not like the old days in school where you might say, we don't want to talk about this or we're going to bring it up. They see everything. So you can't hide your head in the sand. But I think it's also good that Ray Rice eventually does get punished. And you see that a guy who has everything in that term can lose it that quickly. Because if you're a kid and you see it, and you see a guy, he'll get away with it, I can do this, I can do that, then it's awful hard to have it as a teachable moment. Are we but, to the point almost of sensory overload here, though? It seems like there's something every week. Well, if you think about it, the, Twitter is the communication piece today. Many times I'll find out a score of one of our games through Twitter. 
I can't be everywhere I'll hear about it through Twitter. So what will happen is the clip of the video will be sent back and forth, and there'll be discussion through social media about, hey, did you see this? Isn't that funny? Or, hey, this is disgusting. Did you see this? And it's, it's different, and it, it's constantly evolving, and it's tough to keep up with. Pete Shambo is sitting in the fourth seat this week. How about them bills when we return? It's the Challenger Miracle Field, and it's being built in Webster for our physically and emotionally challenged friends. It'll cost a half a million dollars. Opening day is 2016. You can help make it happen. Check it out, WebsterMiracleField.org. Welcome back to the original Rochester Press Box here. Bill Pucko, John DeTulio, Mike Catalana, and Pete Shambo. Uh, how about those Buffalo Bills, Mike? Because they, they, they head into the game against Miami, the home opener, yeah. with a chance to go 2-0. You know, I, it is just one game and it's one win, but this team needed that win. I, I was impressed in the Chicago game because normally when they would fold, adversity, things Marone talked about last year, getting hit with adversity and failing that he worried about, they did the opposite this week. So can they carry it into Miami? I like their chances of doing it. I think the emotion is going to help them, especially early. I like Miami as a team. I like what they're doing on both lines of scrimmage. But I could see Tannehill having a rough time. I can see the Bills getting after it, and I like the Bills in this. You know, there's a lesson there, John, isn't there, about what you, what you see in the preseason? Well, Let it die? No. I mean, <laughs> no. I mean, well, some, nobody saw that Bears out. Well, let me coming. listen. I mean, I'm not saying the Bears were, looked like a Super Bowl contender. I mean, the Bills did. I mean, let's face it. The Bills didn't look like Super Bowl contenders against the Bears. As Mike said, they made plays when they had to. A great defensive play by Kyle Williams. E.J. Manuel played okay. He played well. Made a good throw in, you know, late in the fourth quarter. I mean, Jay Cutler gave him a couple gifts, didn't he? So I think the preseason does matter for teams like the Bills, albeit they only had one win and struggled offensively. They'll be tested this week against a much better Dolphins defense and then the following week against the Chargers. But I like them today because I am not picking against this karma. <laughs> They've got new owners. That place is going to be electric. It's an old rival now with the Dolphins coming to town. Big divisional game. I'll take Buffalo ugly 2017. And yet, and yet you were telling me, and you believe this, there's yeah. a sh certain shelf life as to karma and emotion at the beginning well, of the game. It's the beginning of the game. It's going to play up that way. If it's 14 to nothing Dolphins, then that goes out the window. Now, the home crowd can help you get back in it and all. But if you take advantage of that early, and we have seen this happen before, where teams can just run somebody out of the building. I don't think the Bills are going to score a ton of points. I think it's more defensive pressure on, on Tannehill and Miami that I think it's going to be a good day in Orchard Park. Peter, how do you see it? I see the Bills uh, building on last week's momentum, uh, surprising maybe even themselves, and uh, squishing the fish. Uh, defense. <laughs> the old term. <laughs> <laughs> defense uh, scores a touchdown to make the difference in the game. Squish the fish never gets old. You know that was one, that was one of the good ones. So, uh, John, Bills are going to be two and zero. Oh. You put a score on it, right? I, I like it. I, I think it's going to be an ugly game, a twenty to seventeen. I think it's a close game. Buffalo wins. Yeah, I think Miami's the only team I'd pick them to beat under the circumstances this week. But I'll make it unanimous along with the crew that took Buffalo. Okay, uh, uh, secondary game, best bet, Pete. Um, got a good friend who's a big Saints fan. Uh, Saints took a tough loss last weekend to Atlanta. I'm going to go with the Saints over the Browns in, in Cleveland. Mike? You know, New England is in sole possession of last place in the AFC East. <laughs> we can say that for one week. And, and I think Maybe New England, too. well, when New England can bounce back here, but I like Minnesota. I like Mike Zimmer. I like what he's doing with that team. They're coming home with that emotion, too. I like, I like uh, Minnesota. New England's getting the points. I mean, giving the points. Uh, but I like Minnesota to, uh, to maybe even win the game outright, if not just stay close. I'm going to go right opposite you. I like the Browns off a representative effort against Pittsburgh. Coming home, I think there's a new vibe in Cleveland, I think, along the same lines maybe as Buffalo. To a lesser extent, Cleveland can run that. I'm well, torn. I love Tennessee against Dallas. I'm a big believer in Ken Wisdom, but I'm going to go with the Bengals at home and that defense against Matt Ryan and the Falcons. Motional win over New Orleans. Now they got to go up and go into that jungle and play a very good defensive team. And Andy Dalton, this is a big year. I, I like the Bengals this year. I like the Bengals not only to yeah. win the division, but I think they beat the Falcons and cover the five and a half. Today. Crews going with Jacksonville plus six. They're playing at Washington. Like it or not, win with the
you don't need to be Native American to realize it is offensive. And it's not politically correct. It's the right thing to do. He was an idiot for throwing him that pitch. The guy's phenomenal. He had no reason yeah. to give him anything, especially a fastball to hit. It's simply that these two guys, Ronaldo and Tom Brady, are too good looking. <laughs> I like it, just don't admit to it. <laughs> Everybody wants to hate on the best in the world. You know, he's here, he's here to stay, and he wants to build something big time. The bottom line is, still nobody's gonna like A-Rod. Welcome back to the original Rochester Press Box here, like it or not. Mike, Roger Goodell resigning. Judge, jury, and executioner, right? That's what he's been the whole time. He is an arrogant man hiding behind the shield on many occasions, and he's gotten away with it. And this time, I think he messed up royally. He admitted that he made a mistake, but I think even in doing that, the way he is saying it does not really hold him accountable for how poorly he handled this before. And they have... I mean, come on, Sean Payton gets suspended for a year for his role in Bounty Gate, even though there's no direct evidence of Sean Payton doing anything. The commissioner is heavy handed when it comes to everybody else. It's time he does it for himself. And you know what? Not a single person in the world is going to watch one less football game if Roger Goodell is not the commissioner. That's a good point. Jonathan Vilma was made to be this bad guy, the linebacker in the Saints Bounty Gate. And you remember the Goodell saying, you know, Ray Rice is a good man, he's a good yeah. guy. Right? John the Vilma's bad. Ray Rice is good. Really? I mean, he has, uh, he's, he's a little, he's, uh, he has his priorities out of whack. Administrators and commissioners, that job has become a lot more complex in the last yeah. few years, hasn't it? It, it has. And, and while I, I don't dis disagree that Mr. Goodell made some mistakes and some very serious ones, um, we don't all know everything. We don't all know the whole story. And certainly I'd be disappointed if he, he had that video and they gave the four game suspension. But I also know that uh, there, there's always more to the story than we know. And, and as administrators, we, we get to talk to both parties. We get to um, live by the rules that are in place at the time of the incident. Once the incident takes place and our rules don't seem quite to fit that issue, then we go back, we review those rules, we adjust. I'm really like to see what happens here after this, how the NFL, Roger Goodell deals with this, and I'd like to know what the other professional sports are doing. The NBA is an example. What are what are they doing? Because it can't be exclusive to football. Yeah. Oh, Greg, he's acting quickly, isn't he? I mean, Greg Hardy's playing this weekend, right? And McDonald's playing That's this a lot weekend. Of loose ends. Yeah. So they haven't they haven't done enough yet. Pete, like it or not, uh, athletic director Pat Hayden of Southern Cal coming out onto the field to argue with a football referee. Boy, that's, uh, that's a cardinal sin when it comes to an athletic administrator, coach. Um, we spend so much time with parents, athletes, coaches, fans, talking about appropriate behavior and modeling the appropriate behavior. For Pat to go down to the field for anything other than an absolute emergency, a, probably a medical emergency, to me is way out of whack. Um, there are all sorts of process in place for uh, questioning officials or reviewing tape or anything like that. But uh, he's lucky that a riot didn't ensue from the fans thinking that something must be so drastically wrong that the athletic administrator would come down to the field and argue a call. And had something happened, I, I think his job would be on the line. You know, a lot of people just shrug at this, John, and say, you know, so what? But this is a serious breach of decorum, isn't, isn't it? Isn't he on the board? Yeah, uh, he's going to pick for the... I mean, come on. <laughs> and why is Steve Sarkeesian even calling him? Was he like yeah. calling his dad? <laughs> dad, help me out down here. Yeah, he's Figure it out on your own. And number two, he's got to know better not to come down onto the field. And, and USC's come had on. enough issues through the years. Yes. And the other thing is, too, aren't you surprised it's Pat Hayden? First of all, I think 90% of the general public forgets he was even a player. He was... He was a player. I mean, just the, you, he seems always so kind of buttoned down and got the PR part of it done right. I'm, I'm surprised that he's the athletic director we see on the field. The athletic director is on that 13-member panel either to pick the final four exactly. in college football. I don't like athletic directors yeah. on there. We don't know what happened to Pat earlier in the day. We don't know what other <laughs> situations yeah. he was dealing with. And, um you know, I, I want a guy who's going to think clearer than that. I do. I, I do, too. I can't, can't tell you how many times we as athletic administrators are at events and there's a bad call against our kids or uh, something our coach does gets, gets questioned. And emotionally, we want to argue that. Professionally, no way. Johnny, like it or not, TMZ oh, hey. these days. Well, we were just talking. They broke the three biggest stories this year. They broke the Ray Rice video. They broke... Um, 
the uh, Donald Sterling story and the Jameis Winston story. I think they have a place in today's society and media. They don't know. They're not beholden to anybody. You know, the ESPN and all these others are beholden to the NFL. They're not going to do stories like this. TMZ, listen, they're, they don't have to think twice. That's the one thing. They can just spew stuff out there and whatever sticks, in almost like case. dead spin. Right. But in this case, TMZ's got money, and they don't have, they're not in bed with any of the networks or any of the leagues. Now, I agree with John. They're not in bed with them, but also they, they have no ethical standards no. that they have to, to go with. That being said... TMZ has the video. Nobody is saying the NFL should have gotten the video and released it to the general public. Yeah. But if only Roger Goodell and the NFL had some power and influence in this country, maybe, just maybe, they could have gotten to view that videotape. But, you know, the NFL is just this tiny little organization that basically has no yeah, influence. So. Did you know TMZ is a monster? It is a monster. Just quickly, are, yeah. we, are we in a better place as a society because TMZ exists? I don't believe that question has ever been asked before, <laughs> but since you asked it, I think there is a place for this. Yeah. If you sift out all the other garbage that goes on, I mean, come with TMZ comes the Kardashians and all the other stuff too, which is harmless, I guess. But there are things that are exposed that maybe we wouldn't be hearing other about. Other than Yahoo, who's actually doing investigative reporting in sports nationally? Is Yahoo the only one, really? ESPN tries. I think it's a facade. Yeah. I don't know who's doing investigative. I wouldn't say TMZ is doing investigative <laughs> reporting, but I mean Yahoo is the only one I'll go to that I know of that is doing some investigative reporting. But yeah, TMZ is here to stay and they have a place in our culture. Unfinished business when we return. Welcome back to the original Rochester Press Box. It's time for Unfinished Business. John. 1992-1993. That's right. It's been 21 years since the Yankees have missed the playoffs in back-to-back -back seasons. Pretty amazing stat. The Yankees are on the verge of missing the playoffs for a second straight season. I'd like to sit here and tell you that there's bigger and better things ahead. Like in 1994, the Yankees had a good young crop. Derek Jeter was drafted. He would come up a little bit in 95. They had good young players like Posada and Bernie Williams. And we can go on and on. I like to think that the Yankees have a good young crop, but the answer is no. They've got Masaharo Tanaka, who's probably going to pitch next year, Michael Pineda, good young pitchers, but the nucleus of that team, what, Jacoby Ellsbury, it's a team that is mired now in mediocrity that can't buy itself out of the basement anymore. They've got to almost blow the thing up, almost do what Terry Pagula did with the Buffalo Sabres, and somehow just blow this thing up and almost start all over again. The Yankees are going to try to get a quick fix in the offseason like they do every year and spend millions and millions of dollars. Well, you know what? They've got to look at other teams like Baltimore and even Oakland, although they're mired in a huge slump, and teams like the Cardinals and the Pirates, homegrown products that have now paved the way for success. 21 years since they've missed the playoffs for back-to-back -back years. It'll continue because I guarantee the Yankees will miss the playoffs in 2015. You do have Stephen Drew. It's uh, They're boring and bad right now, and I can't believe they're still in the wild card hunt. Thanks to Bud Selig, they're only five and a half back at the time of this taping. Mr. Shambo, what do you got for us? Unfinished business. I want everybody to remember that uh, educationally based athletics and the learning that comes from it is never finished. I, I want athletes, I want their parents, I want our coaches to take the lessons that are offered through your losses and your failures and remember that there's something to be gained from that and to build upon for the future. 
take the lessons that you've learned from your athletic experiences and build upon the things that you do in your personal life where you have to become teammates and partners and strive through failure, uh, whether it's a loss of a job or whether it's uh, losing a project or, or anything like that. Take the lessons that you've learned from athletics, build on your life, and make it part of your life. I think it's as important now maybe as it's ever been, especially like in this computer age with, with kids that have got, you know, unproductive options. Uh, you know, in all the Terry and Kim Pagula buying the Bills euphoria, it's an awesome thing. But if you look back for the past few years, a lot of fans would come up to me and say, what is Mr. Wilson doing? Why does he not have a plan in place? Why is there no one who's ready to buy this team? Isn't he leaving them exposed? And now that it's all over with, I think everybody owes a very big thank you to Ralph Wilson, not just for his ownership for all those years, but he basically handed this over to Western New York in a way to somewhat somebody to earn the right to buy this team, to somewhat get the money that his family, I won't say deserves, but should get for the franchise, which is what they're going to get, and pave the way for Terry Pagula. The way the lease was written, the way the provisions of the trust were set up, having Mary Wilson as the person who eventually is going to do it, set it all up for somebody of Western New York to buy it, and that happens to be Terry Pagula. Everybody else was either no good as a bidder or scared to death to come into Western New York to try to buy the bills. So Ralph really did have a plan in place, and it worked out well. The Bills will never leave, and that really is his legacy for Western New York. It's almost like he's still here, you know? Smiling down, his <laughs> team is there. Now they got to get him a Super Bowl. There's an old expression that if you don't like the weather, wait a minute, it'll change. Uh, you know, a week ago we were in a very bad place. Officer Daryl Pearson had just been murdered. Larry and Jane Glazier's plane had disappeared in the Gulf of Mexico. The narrative has changed since. Now the, the Buffalo Bills won a game. The sale has gone through. The, the future is secured. And Jim Kelly beat cancer. Uh, it's hard to make sense of all this stuff as you go from bad to good. And I think maybe the best approach is to simply be grateful when things are going well. We'd like to thank you for joining us here on the Rochester Press Box. John DeTulio, thank you very much. Really nice good job stuff as always. Today. Mike Catalana. Good. Pete Shambo, it's been a real pleasure having you in. Penfield thank you Athletic all. Director and the President-Elect of Section 5. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week in the original Rochester Press Box.